Welcome, everyone. All power to the people. Tortuguita vive. My name is Patrick. I'm an uh, agroecolog agroecologist and community organizer here in so-called Chicago. We are so excited uh, to welcome you all to this uh, discussion we'll be having um, entitled Every City is Stop Cop City. Um, I was asked to uh, co-moderate this event, um, which is hosted by uh, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Um, so to stay connected to us, we got our, our link in the chat. And um, we're so happy and thrilled to be um, having um, this discussion with everyone. Our hope with this discussion um, is that this can be an opportunity where revolutionaries around the country can gather uh, share ideas, stories, and learn um, from each other as we build solidarity in our struggle um, for liberation from ruling class systems. Uh, and this is kind of the uh, what we in the League are all about is building these types of networks, bridges between people, between um, cities and, and geographies. Um, so I uh, am going to kick it over to uh, my co-moderator, um, Mac. Um, and yeah, we'll be, um... hey, there you are, Mac. Hey, everybody. Uh, as Patrick said, my name is Mac. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a community organizer. Uh, I'm based in Sacramento, California. I work with groups like the Sacramento Tenants Union um, and Decarcerate Sacramento, uh, which is kind of, uh, I'm really excited to be having this conversation today. Um, it's an abolitionist organization that works to uh, stop jail expansions, reduce jail populations, and demand the vital reinvestment in a care economy, things like housing, food access, mental health substance use services, and more, all the things that we know are proven preventions and alternatives um, to, to jails. Uh, very excited to be here. Very excited to have this discussion with y'all. And I believe that uh, Patrick's going to come back up and introduce all of our speakers. Uh, I will name that we are going to have a section at the end where we are going to encourage you to put your questions and stuff in the chat. And then if you want, if you want you'll be able to come off mute and ask your question to, those, uh, to the speakers. Uh, we are going to ask, though, that you keep your uh, question to uh, two to three minutes. We have a timekeeper who will let you know when your time is almost up in the chat. Um, and to make space for everybody, we are going to ask that after your question is over to mute. It is really easy for us to want to engage and keep going back and forth. But it, but we know that we have many people in the space who will want to ask some questions. Um, so make space for other people to speak your truth as well. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mac. So. We are just so honored and um, blessed to be joined um, by all of you. And um, we are going to be um, highlighting the um, work and ideas um, of um, three comrades who have agreed to join us here today. Um, and yeah, so so like was Mac, Mac was saying um, how this is going to work is we'll hear from each of our presenters for about five to seven minutes um, or, or so, give or take. Um, and then we'll be diving into some questions that uh, we've, we've been preparing and thinking about for them. And um, after that, we'll, we'll, we'd love for audience participation for this to become a, a dialogue of a uh, free flowing dialogue of people um, all um, 68 of us and counting to um, share our ideas. Um, so we're joined, of course, by um, Reverend Shabon Cornell, um, uh, Matthew Johnson, and Asha, uh, Asha Edwards. Um, and love for, um, we're going to basically, yeah, hear about their work um, and uh, their thoughts and um, but we'll kick it off first um, with uh, Reverend Chaban. Um, if um, feel free to open us up, we'll have about ten minutes if you'd like, um, comrade, to just share your your um, your work, your story, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you. 
Madoja gave you stay. Chabon Colonel Chaho Tip Kados, Hadoga, I'm a legate. Uh, hello, we can eat it all. Um, today, um, uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to, to be here with each one of you, uh, kind relatives, even seeing some names come across the screen there, uh, persons I haven't seen in a long time. It, it uh, makes me a little emotional that uh, we have to, uh, to do things this way, but such, such as it is. Um, I, it's my pleasure to come share just a little bit with you. Um, as most of uh, our folks know, um, I'm a member of our Seminole and Muscogee people whose homelands come from originally the, the southeastern portion of what we now call the United States. Um, human inhabitation in these locations, you know, somewhere close to 20,000 years before our migratory paths into that area. Um, I, I constantly remind our our people all across the, this country of how deep all of our indigenous peoples go back to this area. So if it was, if I was knowledgeable enough, because we have persons from all over this country, I would have shared a greeting in every language of indigenous peoples that you represent there, because that's my hope. You know, I know many languages. I know how to say thank you. I know how to say hello. Wherever I go, I try to pick up something. But the fact of the matter is, no matter where you are today, you are on indigenous lands. You are on indigenous in, in indigenous communities that in some form or fashion, there is a story there. There is a, a way of life that was there and is there that sometimes isn't always able to be seen by the non-indigenous world. So I just want to start out that way as I share my respect to all of our indigenous peoples uh, today across a Turtle Island, across North America, because this is a, a special time of year, even for our Southeastern peoples uh, of Muscogee people. We are coming out of our Agilone and Bosqueda, which is our green corn time. We are just now ended that a, cu a couple of weeks ago. So it's a time of harvest. It's a time of being able to eat foods that we haven't been able to eat uh, for ceremonial reasons, for religious reasons. And so it's a time of rejoicing. And so that's where my heart is today as we have yet um, accomplished another year of existence in a world that in this day and age is violent to our existence. And so I celebrate that for all of our people um, across not just Turtle Island, even as I sit here, I'm convicted that uh, I have uh, broken bread and had fellowship with indigenous peoples all over the world. And I'm mindful of them at this hour. And so I think about them and, and to be honest, uh, my hope is to always, the words that I say and the actions that I'm a part of will always help to perpetuate our way of life as indigenous peoples because there's a reason why we stand here today. There's a reason why we're trying to build our, our energy, our momentum, our, our, our bridges across cultures, that there's something going on in the world around us that isn't right. There's something that is sinful to all of creation, that is sinful to this earth mother and, and the existence of all species. And that's something that, you know, when we think about the violence that is being perpetuated and that we've seen firsthand in uh, the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, um, there's, there's something that uh, we have to uh, resist. And so that's why my hope is today, and, and I'm thankful for that. You know, I, I stand here, what I shared in just a, the few lines I shared in our Muscogee language, I let you know who I am. And the two things that I always say is what clan did I come from? Hodo uh, Gogi, it means if you just heard that one word by, it, by itself, it's like, I would tell you, it's who I am. So it's like saying wind clan, wind people is who I am when you hear that. And so that's who I represent since the very uh, beginning of time, the very beginning of creation when our people came into existence that they say that this was the first clan that came down uh, onto this earth mother as there were others, uh, uh, human beings that were going and searching for living, living life. And there was a thick cloud or a fog that was so thick they couldn't see. And so they reached out trying to uh, make a way in life, and life became to be uh, very unbearable, and they cried out to this energy that was the source of all creation uh, for help, and that that source of creation sent down uh, my ancestors, these, the, the wind clan, to blow that wind aw away so that we could see each other, and today I still have persons who say that I still do that as a member of this clan because I help us to see a better way, to see each other again, and to live in a way that is respectful of all the diversity of, of creation. And so, but the other thing that I shared is that I am a traditional practitioner of our uh, indigenous peoples, and that usually I don't talk too much about it because we have a protocol 
we have a way of existence in our Native American community, in our indigenous community, where I would usually have a speaker that would say uh, these things on my behalf. It wouldn't be coming from my voice. It would be for, they call it uh, the, the tongue that would speak for me. And um, But I do have a position at this moment in time uh, serving our uh, Muscogee people. And so today, one of the things that has brought me here, you know, I, I sit here and even as the introductions uh, were going around, I, I, it's been a long time since I've been called a reverend. Um, I, I am ordained in the United Methodist Church, which uh, I don't know how to say it. it. It's complicated, I guess you could say. Um, you know, even people ask me, why do I continue to stay within this movement? And to be quite honest, and, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, it's because that's where I've witnessed the sickness is in that uh, particular system. And because I have compassion for that that system to be better tomorrow than they were yesterday, I still, uh, I still am there because I do believe that all throughout history, it has been the, the Christian faith that has been the most violent uh, of entities against uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, here in this country and worldwide. And so as opposed to doing my work somewhere else, I, I, I choose to speak to that violence to its face and to say, here's how you can exist in a better way. And also here's how you can value and appreciate cultures all across the world who are striving to speak a truth that has been there eons upon eons, a millennia upon millennia, as we try to see the, the, the dangers of what's going on in society around us. And so a lot of my work has been with that community, but I do know I've been called in other circles, in, in other uh, arenas to speak that same truth to government entities, to, uh, to, to church entities, but also to our own people, to our grassroots uh, indigenous peoples, giving them you know just reassurance that they are not wrong in their pursuit for self-determination, that they are not wrong when they say there's a better way to live when they see violence, when we see violence at every direction we go. And so that's what I bring here. It was just two years ago, um, as we approached this uh, fall season, that we were at one of our ceremonial times here in Oklahoma. And I was approached by uh, two organizers from the Atlanta area who said, can you come help us? There's something going on. And they continued to debrief me on the potential deforestation. At that moment in time, Cop City was a little bit more distant than it is now. It was a little bit, it was viewed differently than it is now. And they said, will you come out there? Will you help us to educate uh, our communities? Now, they had already known that I had already taken, you know, these moments for family, for our Muscogee people, that we engaged in migrations back of uh, re-educating, of starting endeavors, of trying to remember, you know, what our relationship was with this earth, uh, earth mother. And so we had already done that uh, many times. And they said, can you come help us? Because something's going on where they're going to destroy a significant portion of ancestral homelands. And I said, I said, tell me more. And they proceeded to go ahead and, and debrief me on the situation. And I said, well, I said, let me let me talk to the our family, let me talk to our folks, and we'll come out there. And so it was just about maybe a month later, we went out to at that time they were still calling it the South River Forest. And now we refer to it as the Wilana Forest. Uh, Wilani is kind of uh, how they say it in the area. And we did some of our traditional dances, we spoke our language, we had speeches given, we had our children out there. I think over 20 persons from Oklahoma went to this area and began, began a process of reintroducing ourselves to our homelands. Now, this was the same area that today has already been destroyed. Um, you know, there's certain areas that are still intact, but there's also just right next to it places that have already been clear cut. And I, the last I had heard, I think there's some kind of massive effort to pour concrete into the facility that they're trying to build, which at that day when we danced, I just learned about of a police training facility, Cop City, and automatically I knew the, the horrific consequences of such an endeavor um, because I've been all over the world and I've known how paramilitary forces have been hired to assassinate, 
hired to remove, hired to intimidate indigenous peoples all over the world. And at that moment in time, even though the position that I, I have with our communities here of indigenous peoples, I walk a road of, of peace. It's a, a white road is what they say, of peace and harmony. Um, I sit in a seat that is, is white for compassion and love. I knew that I could not be silent because something is wrong with it. That's not how this earth is supposed to be. That's not how this world is supposed to be. And so that's when I began this journey. And so I, I, you know, I didn't know where it would go. I didn't know how many relatives that I would find all across this country and even the, the, the kind words that have been shared to me because I didn't, I don't, you know, I kind of do it as a profession, but it's more as a spiritual practitioner, as someone who tries to say there is a way that we can live that, you know, it might seem revolutionary to persons in our country today, but for us, it is traditional because it takes us back to a moment before we ever encountered colonizing entities. It takes us back to a moment before we were forcibly changed. You know, even as I sit here with one of our boarding school uh, shirts, as we think about this month of September, uh, remembering those who were taken to re-education centers in the history of this country, um, we overcame that. You know, there's a way of life that we had that was in place. And so today, you know, whether it's through mechanisms and systems such as the church, whether it's through mechanisms with civic partners and universities, whoever it might be, my hope is that now we start this migration back physically, but also mentally and spiritually to come back to a way of existing on this earth that does no violence to any of earth's diversity, to the species of this earth and to each other. And as we all know, as we've seen the stories, nothing could be further, uh, further from reality as we've tried to speak truth to systems of violence uh, over, especially this past year, trying to say, here's how you should exist here, only to see things amplified, you know, intimidation tactics amplified. Because the reality is what has happened here in Atlanta, what has happened in Georgia, it's been happening year after year to people of color. It goes all the way back to the civil rights era. It goes all the way back to the foundation of this country, of the United States. It goes all the way back to our first interactions. You know, we're thinking about Standing Rock. We're thinking about Oak Flat. We're thinking about all these places where these intimidation tactics have been put in place. Laws have been passed to criminalize just saying no, just dissenting from what we're seeing happening, that we are now in a moment where we cannot even say stop, stop doing the harm, because now even just doing that, we suffer risk. And we see that happening with some of our comrades in uh, Atlanta right at this very moment who are facing certain charges. So today, my hope is that we continue to normalize the acceptance of dissent. We recognize those systems of violence that are in place and that we continue to bond together because that's really what these systems of intimidation try to do is to segregate and isolate us in one part of the country and one part of society, even tribal groups of Native American people. Well, they're not complaining over here, you know, they, they separate us. But in all reality, the same violence is what we're facing all over the country and really all over the world. So today it is my pleasure, and I don't know if I took too much time. Forgive me if I did my relatives. I know there are more voices out there that that can speak uh, better things than I can say, but um, I never thought I would be on this journey. But when someone asks me to help, if I'm able to help, it is within our culture to do whatever we can to uh, make a better way for our people, You know, make a better way and a better future for our children. So that's why I'm thankful to be here um, on uh, this evening with each of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Um, oh. That was amazing. Um, thank you for opening us up. Um, yeah, I think um, we uh, should go to Atlanta um, to uh, hear um, 
uh, from Matthew Johnson. Um, uh, would love Matt if you were able to. Yeah, there's so much. There's so much going on right now. I'm sure these this past you know couple of weeks have been um, a lot. But if you would um, be able to just um, tell us about your work um, in Atlanta um, and yeah, share whatever you, you feel like um, relating to what uh, Chabon said and, and just, yeah, um, tell us about how, how it's going down there. Well, first and foremost, I feel like I've been set up. I can't believe that you are expecting me to follow that now. That's uh, terribly unfair for anybody um, that has to speak after everything has already been said. Um, and at the end of the day, what I think is most important is that we continue to forge alliances, especially among Black and Indigenous people. Uh, there have so many. There have been so many things that uh, we've suffered, uh, even on that land in particular that it's deeply important that we protect it as well as our people and make sure that we are continually expanding our own agency to protect ourselves and our people because we cannot expect everybody to do that which is in our interests and we've seen that. But I digress. Um, uh, for legal reasons, I think I may be vague at some point. Uh, but uh, I am here in Atlanta, worse for the wear. Uh, last week, there were five dozen and one people uh, that were indicted with RICO charges in the city of Atlanta. Uh, many of those folks had already faced charges uh, ranging from domestic terrorism, putting out flyers that the police didn't like, uh, to accuse uh, charity fraud for people paying their Wi-Fi bill where they ran a nonprofit organization from in their house. Uh, the nature of the charges and the repression here is absurd. And often the response that it actually deserves does not necessarily behoove us to execute, right? And so this is a uh, balancing act, I think, that we have been managing uh, throughout this struggle, that as we watch uh, the world burn and many people uh, are, you know, acting in response to that, um, it doesn't always behoove us to act proportionally when so many of our fellow citizens are still asleep. Um, Throughout this fight, I hope that I've done something to awaken the consciousness of people throughout the greater Atlanta area, especially around the forest that have been involved with this fight in several different ways. Um, I've been involved with this fight uh, since we first got wind of it uh, in early 2021 the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta Police Foundation were promoting this, even invoking the name of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and calling this the Institute for Social Justice, uh, Cop City, which would essentially be the largest militarized police uh, training facility in North America, only second to Brazil, uh, that just so happens to have the largest African diaspora population, right? Uh, so, well, what we know is that policing is deeply tied to anti-Blackness uh, in the United States. And we've known that for quite some time. And uh, Atlanta has so many headwinds in that respect because you oftentimes have Black faces in high places uh, that sell ideas that primarily serve white corporations. Uh, and you have a uh, black workforce that is deeply underpaid. Um, the median household income for black families is one third that of white households in Atlanta. And so this creates a headwind in which you may have uh, representatives in cases of a system that does not serve black people, uh, that uh, speak on behalf of interests that do not serve black people. 
and continue to push forward these systems that deal us debt. And then on, in addition to that, uh, and this is recorded uh, even in the New York Times about two, three months ago, where you have had, you know, black kids, especially in Atlanta, pigeonholed into programs from JROTC from the time they're about 14 years old in the military, then when they get back to the military, they end up police. So you have, you know, young black kids who think that they're doing the right thing that have been sent to the front lines of racial capitalism that is killing our folks and uh, they trade in uh, their solidarity uh, for an entrance into the middle class. People make bad decisions every day. And I, I just think that that is very important for us to understand this context um, when we're choosing the language that we use to reach a broader base in Atlanta. Because what we require now is reaching a broader base throughout the city of Atlanta of people. And you would be shocked, some of the people that have expressed support for this movement. Um, just to go back, as I was saying, I've been involved since the beginning. Uh, just wherever I was required, that's where I was. Whether that meant, you know, uh, sometimes lifting heavy stuff. Uh, whether that be canvassing and over the past uh, seven months, I have done some work with different coalition groups uh, from especially the Faith Coalition, uh, where I had been most visible over the past few months. Uh, however, in this particular iteration of the fight, I'm realizing that I have to reevaluate uh, the ways in which I engage, uh, just in terms of efficacy. Right, uh, we have seen the fight shift terrain several times. Right, from essentially being like an electoral battle in war. Every nine people. Ultimately, John, soon after the grand jury's pregnancy. I hear a game in somebody's background. Okay, great. That's been taken care of. Thank you. Yes, uh, but I've been involved in different facets of the movement uh, for quite some time. And at, at this particular juncture, I find myself uh, really taking some time to reevaluate uh, the ways in which I engage with the space uh, to make sure that, um, that the fight doesn't stop with Cop City uh, and make sure that we clearly understand uh, and that we are grounding this in a much larger ethic of abolition, right? And as far as I'm concerned, uh, especially being a black man in these spaces, uh, the people that are most affected uh, by mass incarceration in the United States, it is very important that moving forward that uh, the organizing that I'm doing is engaging and supporting the people most affected. That hasn't always been the case. So that's something that I know that I need to make sure to make sure that I am doing direct action to support my own community. And also, you know, building a stronger alliances, especially among the indigenous community. We have some things coming forward with that uh, to make sure uh, that uh, our folks are establishing their own agency in the fight to save black lives. Despite all these headwinds that I mentioned, right? Uh, that could explain why, in many cases, uh, these spaces become very white. Uh, but we must be cognizant and make sure that we are creating containers and spaces uh, that really create opportunities for Black folks to advocate for themselves, because that's what it's going to take, especially people that require or that truly understand the nuances and the fights moving forward. Uh, so yeah, there are going to be some things forthcoming in that respect uh, that are currently being developed. Uh, but I, I think that it's very important is that in all of our dialogue moving forward, we're truly understanding uh, that the world ain't right. And that we can navigate these nuances and better uh, serve the most affected populations 
and engage the most affected populations in everything that we do, and that we are taking active steps towards an abolitionist world. And so that is my focus now as I uh, recalibrate. That's that's amazing. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, and yeah, I I I think we'll we'll get more into that. Um, all those all those threads. Um, soon. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to um, uh, a comrade here in Chicago, Asha Edwards. Um. Yeah, Asha. Um, is a community organizer with the dissenters um, and um, was a was a big part of, of uh, No Cop Academy, which was a struggle. We'll um, hear them talk about it some more. So yeah, Aisha, please um, uh, take it away. Um, tell us about um, your work here and um, any thoughts you have and, that you want to open up with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Asha. My pronouns are she, they. And uh, when I was younger, I was a part of the No Cop Academy campaign in Chicago. And first, I just want to give a little background of No Cop Academy to connect it to the current ongoing Stop Cop City movement. But uh, back in 2015, our former, former mayor, Rahm Emanuel, wanted to build this $95 million dollar a police academy on the west side of Chicago in West Garfield Park. And we didn't want that. So over the course of a few years, um, a lot of youth, it was youth led, we were all like in high school, but a youth led campaign arose to stop the cop academy. And through this, we collaborated with, I believe over 80 organizations to spread the word because the city forced this upon us. They didn't ask the residents. They didn't ask like, hey, do you guys actually want this? Or is there anything we could utilize it better for? So dozens, of, well, actually hundreds, hundreds of people came together to create an amazing toolkit, uh, which was utilized, which what we heard was utilized for early Stop Cop City actions. So it was such a privilege to actually go to Atlanta a few months ago with the uh, some of the No Cop Academy crew to learn like, so how does this intersect? But with the No Cop Academy campaign, we realized how the city tries to scare us in a way. And as we could see with um, the Cop Academy, uh, this is like a fear tactic. And what I noticed is throughout this campaign, uh, with No Cop Academy and with Stop Cop City, I just learned more of like, what is the presence of abolition and what do we need to be safe? Because what I've learned is that we build safety through our relationships and community resources. And you can never ever train the inherent violence out of policing. And I feel like we gotta know like the answer is abolition. The police will always be violent. Reforms have happened for hundreds of years. Policing is just violence. There is no policing. It's just, well, there is no police violence. It is just policing. So with that, um, going to Atlanta, it was a very like eye-opening experience, kind of bringing home the intersections of environmentalism, US imperialism, uh, climate change, also abolition, of course. And what I learned there, um, it was fascinating going into the forest. And I'm not going to speak much on that because they're throwing RICO charges out just for talking about mutual aid and taking care of each other. And the state does not want us to take care of each other because they need a reason to appear legitimate. So with that, um, I wanted to share that with no cop, academy like with stop cop city i've just noticed so much community support like it's been so incredible like watching just people really just fighting for each other's livelihoods mm -hmm. and it's really been an inspiration to like a great reminder like okay in chicago even though the cop academy was ultimately built we did delay it for a few years 
And now um, with our current mayor, which was also a fight, even though he's still our target, he is never, I don't know, I, I won't consider a mayor progressive, but now I'm like, well, if you have this cop academy built, what can we fight for now? And what I saw with No Cop Academy is it spread it out into other campaigns, such as the Cops Out CPS campaign, which I was a part of, and we were able to get cops out of 17 Chicago public schools. And now recently, um, I've been a part, like doing some work with a, an organization called We Are Dissenters, and they are an anti-militarist, anti-war organization organizing to basically get rid of the military presence on our campuses. And when I think of Atlanta, um, it is hyper-militarized policing tactics they're using. Uh, they're basically, I remember seeing like a tank, um, not like there, but in pictures. And with this, you got to remember the U.S. is the belly of the beast. Like they're bringing all of their military tactics they're bringing their war and terror like to home on its people, on predominantly black and brown people. Um, again, because they think that they are legitimate, even though they are an illegitimate, um, illegitimate settler colonial, patriarchal, white supremacist, terrorist state. And with this, we we have to remember the US acts as a global police force. So if they're losing ground here. I'm just saying that means we're really stirring up like good trouble, <laughs> not to say good trouble, like we need, I'm an advocate for, well, I can't say that on here, but I'm an advocate for, you know, messing stuff up on the ground uh, if needed. So take that with what you will, because we got to try. And not to say that like using violence in a, in a sense, um, because violence to me looks like not having enough food to eat. It looks like dirty water. It looks like polluted air, food deserts, no affordable housing. It looks like nonprofits taking over, dismantling, real organizing. It looks like prisons, policing. It's just like, that's that's not what we need. And, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so when I think about Atlanta, um, this is really like a historical moment right now. And it is very scary. Like it's it's been kind of kind of scary to watch because you know in Chicago, like there were a few arrests here and there, but they weren't throwing out RICO charges and domestic terrorism charges. So what I see is like there's absolutely going to be an escalation of um, state violence trying to neutralize us, but we have to keep moving forward because what else can we do? And in organizing, you know, sometimes you do lose, but in that you grow this, you grow the seeds of sprouting new campaigns that tackle and pitch and chip away at policing and apple, I mean policing and prison um, institutions. So what I really just want to say <laughs> overall with Stop Cop City um is we have to build abolition every day. And by building abolition every day, that means Building like, so what does our neighborhood need? Like, do you know your neighbor? Do you knock on the door and like build a relationship with them, ask what they need? And also fighting for like fighting also for city money because the city, like the city of Chicago has billions of dollars and we're taxpayers. So we should be involved in that of how our tax money is spent because in Chicago, they spend $4.5 million on the police every single day. So as we campaign like outside of the city council, um, I do think um, we should fight for getting city money, city resources, because they should be doing their job to ensure that we have community gardens, renewable energy jobs, affordable housing, violence prevention programs, fully funded Chicago public schools, safe environments, and decrease police presence. Well, of course we want to abolish them, but like somewhere we gotta start. And I feel like we could start that with other campaigns going on, especially with We Are Dissenters. They recently just had an amazing, like phenomenal solidarity action in Chicago today um, near the former Boeing headquarters. And um, I was gonna go, but 
I had COVID recently. I didn't want to risk that, but they were phenomenal. And I hope you check out what they did. Um, it was it was a very heart touching solidarity action of South Cop City. But yeah, in these cracks, we have to build that presence. We have to continue fighting back because if we don't try, then what are we here for? Like we can't let the state just take our power. They think we have no power, but you have to take it. You have to stand in your own power, stand in your own community power. Because at the end of the day, it is our duty to fight for our freedom, as Asada Shakur has said. But yeah. Wow, y'all are so powerful. Like it was so amazing to be able to sit and hear all of that for. I hope that that inspired and really spoke to all of y'all as well. I am going to wait just one moment for um, our spotlights to change. We're going to get up all the speakers, as well as me and Patrick. Um, and then what we're going to do is ask a series of questions. Um, some of it you have spoken on in what you just spoke and what y'all were just saying. Um, and, and I think that's even part of like why we named this program Every City is Cop City uh, or Stop Cop City. You know, like we are all out here doing this work, even here in Sacramento, we're in the middle of having to fight a billion dollar mental health jail, you know, because they don't want to just build, <laughs> I see your face. <laughs> yeah, a billion dollars. Um, and so I'm, and so the first question and this, the, and I just want to wait for Siobhan to be um, pinned up here as well. Um, the first question is, is something that Shaban and y'all really spoke to a little bit, but how how is this movement to and again every city is stop cop city? How is this movement to stop cop city um, for a rematriation of Muskogee and Indigenous lands? And uh, I think that we can just kind of make it to where each of the speakers kind of decide how they want to hop in. I don't want to call on y'all, um, so I'll just open it up. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with that one. I think that probably would be most appropriate. Um, I think yeah. <laughs> I see Matthew laugh. Um, you know, number one, the concept of rematriation. Even indigenous peoples have been dispossessed from understanding even what that means of coming back to our original connection to what it means to walk upon this earth. The fact of the matter is, and this is what I told the okay. Atlanta City Council in June is that right now 97% of this earth has already been manipulated by human interaction, meaning that only 3% of this earth is in its natural state. So what we have to come to terms with as a country is that every forest, every tree, every natural environment is of significant value that we are really cutting our own throats when we destroy it. And if we're doing that, we're impacting generations to come um, and the violence and the sicknesses that they will face, drinking water that isn't clean, having microplastics in our systems, having forms of skin cancer, on and on and on. Bam, it's right there. But then when you tie it to the economic system of capitalism that is there to commodify anything that there is to commodify, and you see this system just inherently, uh, the tentacles of it infecting every aspect of consciousness that we are, are, are under, understood to, to, to live in this country of the United States. That's what we're starting to address. And that's what my hope is, is that while there's still time, while you have practitioners such as myself to come back to our first way of interacting with this earth, of coming back to our understanding, you know, before, you know, we've had, I think five or six weeks of action. I can't, I've lost count of how many weeks of actions we've had in uh, Atlanta, uh, six, um, in the, the March one, I, I, my cousin and myself, we came to this, uh, the Wilani forest. And at that time it was not being policed as it is now. And so we went in there. And the first thing that I did is I, I, I brought my own, we call it hiji, but tobacco. And I asked this mother earth, I said, is it okay if we bring our relatives here to talk about the significance of this forest? Is it okay to come here and to bring our relatives to this area because it is gonna have an impact. She will have to provide for food and water and for an increased amount of people. I said, can we have permission as we try to make this world a better place? And I did that with nobody around. And I, I asked that of her and gave, gave her that offering. 
that's one small concept of coming back to rematriation. I, I just shared with some, we have elections in our Muscogee Nation going on right now for tribal officials. Uh, as a traditional person, I, we were asked to come in and share with them. And part of what, what, I, what I told them is that, you know, without, you know, any understanding of how we are to exist in this earth, what right do we have to say we represent Muscogee or indigenous life? It starts with that. It starts with our understanding of how we walk here in all of creation. That is rematriation. It starts with that. And the last thing I told him, I said, if you want to end the violence against indigenous women, if you want to end the violence against our spiritualities, our language and our culture, it all begins with this earth. One of the things that I did not share in my introduction when I say that I'm a part of the, my clan lineage is that we are a matrilineal society. So every, my mother, my grandmother, all the way back since the beginning of time, I get that clan lineage from all the way back to this mother earth is that when I say who I am, it's my way, it's us honoring where we come from and this earth coming back to that consciousness and who, well, we, we do live in a world that is hurting right now, but in a, in a world that is, is better, we don't hurt our mothers. We don't hurt our grandmothers. We don't hurt those that are given life, uh, life protecting properties all the way back to this earth. By saying that, that's rematriation and coming back to say, I will be gentle with every step that I take on this earth. And my hope is that because indigenous peoples, it's not just, you know, it's not only Muscogee people that think that way, that's a common characteristic in indigenous cultures all across the world. But my hope before the violence is too great that society will take notice and say, we can live in a different way and come back to this earth. We can live in a different way. We can put down our weapons and pick up water and share it with each other. We can pick up bread and share it with each other. We can see that, that you know, we don't have to be afraid of differences. And that's what rematriation is. And so what I shared, and this is something I've shared every time I go to my homelands, is that my hope is that all our people as indigenous peoples, but all of us together, will have a chance to start that rematriation process before it's no longer possible, before there is no forest, before there is no indigenous peoples, before there is no indigenous languages to speak. The time is right here in front of us. And so that's what my hope is as we partner, you know, you know, Matthew and I, different ones, uh, you know, where we, we, we walk together is that we walk in solidarity solidarity to say this isn't how it is supposed to be and this isn't how we're going to tolerate uh things and even I'll, I'll stop with this when we first came out after that you know when i came out in, in february i said i won't let your violence define my interaction with my homelands though you took one of my relatives there and harmed them and you know i still stand here in reverence for tortugita and belkis is a, a relative of mine too uh, uh, I think about them quite often. I said, I won't let your violence dictate how I interact with creation. I'm going to come here with the same values that existed on these territories for millennia. And that's what my hope is. Before that violence increases anymore. And to be honest, you know, this country has only been here 247 years. Muscogee ancestors have been there over 15,000 years in these territories. I think there's something, some wisdom there. I think we know what we're talking about when we think about sustainable living. And it's with respect and reverence for all of diversity. So to me, that's what my hope is in rematriation, giving us a chance to come back to what we once always knew and walk upon this earth gently and reverently. And I'm thankful that I have brought my kids there, my children there, and I have yet to bring my, I have a four year, four month old grandson that one day. He will get to see me dance. Just like I did in that same forest. That I get to do the things that I've been able to do in past months. And that's what we're working for so that they have a good way of life and they won't have to look over their shoulder and duck from so-called police violence 
for simply just loving this earth, simply just loving each other. And that's what that's what rematriation to me means as an indigenous person. Yes, thank you so much, Siobhan. Um, we can we can keep the questions going um, unless Matt or Asha, you guys have something to say on that word. Yeah, I think I think that about um, yeah is a is a very important um, well said you know clarification for a lot of us on rematriation. Um, <laughs> so yeah so moving on to the, the another question we have um and going back to asha what you were talking about in terms of um you know abolition as um you know so many people like to say so many people misunderstand abolition as just destroying something right and I'm not sure about you all, but I think that we uh, lost Patrick at abolition is more than just destroying something. And I couldn't agree more. You're doing a great job whenever you come back. You can hop in and support. Um, and I think that is it, right? It's like abolition. And I we had Ruthie Wilson Gilmore on a previous panel where she spoke and straight up said that uh, everybody thinks that abolition is is destroying it, scorching the earth, covering with salt and not going anything for the next seven years on it. Um, when what it really is, is it's beyond that. And it and that we can't get to destroying these things until we talk about the transformation of the creation of new, right? Um, and then that is what abolition is. It's our willingness to dream. And so the next question is, is and, and that's what I think Patrick was saying when what you're speaking about, Asha, is like, how is this idea to stop Cop City, this fight, this movement, that is national and global, um, a fight for a community reinvestment in basic needs. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm like, wow, it's just so many great words. But uh, I guess like when I think of Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore's quote, abolitionist presence and about life affirming institutions, I think, um, just in the United States, we need empire to crumble for true abolition, for true justice. We need land back. We need to support the Black diaspora. We need to support all of the diasporas caused by um, the slave trade, neocolonialism. We have to fight against neoliberalism. And all of those are also like fights for abolition. Like if we want to reach abolition, we have to destroy these serious state oppressions that exploit um, many different populaces and communities. And um, when I think of abolitionist presence, um, I, I like to think about the little things because sometimes when you think about all of those, it's like, whoa, that's a lot. Well, how can I do that? But really you could do a lot um, in your own neighborhood, your own block, your own town of just like asking what people need. Um, I feel like it's a great start. Like, what do you need to like have a better life in a way? But also I think people should support people who are directly incarcerated in a cage, um, especially those who were judged based off the worst thing they did and serving life, uh, life sentences. And when we think about transformative justice, um, even though there are so many ways of how to practice abolition. Uh, I feel like <clears throat> we should definitely try to reduce harm, like learn how to reduce harm, teaching kids um, about consent. I feel like it's a huge thing, changing sexual education curriculum, especially in Chicago, because ours was horrible. We didn't learn anything. And I'm like, what? But um, abolition like is every day again. And um, you could always fight for reducing the your city's policing budget, like see how much they spend a day 
versus how much they put into housing or infrastructure or extracurricular activities for kids or youth job trainings. Um, but yeah, I really want to focus on just like youth, especially when I think of abolition, because they are the future. They are literally like they're going to have to survive this earth once. Well, the climate catastrophe is here, but they're the ones who are going to have to navigate it. So how do you fight for a better world for them like in the here right now? So they won't have to fight so much for their own survival. And also with abolition, um, I think of like everyday relationships. Like how do I how do I resolve conflict? Do I know how to resolve conflict? That's a big question, but do I try to solve conflict in a way that doesn't cause more harm? Um is a question I like to think about. I love reading toolkits, especially by Oh, I could share some like critical resistance or transform harm by the wonderful Miriam Kava. And, but yeah, uh, when I think of abolition, I think of freedom. I think of black liberation. I think of everybody's oppression being lifted. I think about freeing Palestine. I think about destroying all of like in the ruins of these destroyed settler colonial nations we have I don't know, new liberated societies, which is fun and exciting to think about because hope is a discipline. Right now, the world can be very scary, but we have to be disciplined in our hope because if we just, if we don't believe that it can get better, then what are we, what are we fighting for if you don't believe we can do better? But that's like what I think about in terms of abolition, especially in Chicago. Like I remember um, there's a wonderful defund CPD campaign and they they did so many community like events and actions and I'm like this is building community this is safety and also violence disruption um kind of like de-escalation teachings is so useful um when I think about that I really think of like youth because I don't know like when you're youth you learn all of these skills that society placed on you and since the U.S. loves violence, they're going to learn violence to resolve their issues. And that's not how abolition really wants. That's not that's not abolition. So uh, I really want to focus on youth organizing, but like actually not telling them what to do, like literally listening to them, not assuming what they need, listening to them, let them have the power as well. But yeah, that's what abolition is to me in the city. Amazing. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so looking at our time here, 7.04, um, sorry, uh, central time, um, we, we have about another 30 minutes scheduled, but I, I think we're totally prepared to go a little over that. Um, so moving on to the next question, or no, Matt, do you want to weigh in on that question? Oh, no, I was, I was saying I can move on. I'm not uh, I can't stay over um, okay. another 30 minutes. Got you. Um, let's, so then let's go to this, the third question here. Um, and yeah, I'd love to, for you to, um, you know, share your thoughts if you'd like. Um, how is Stop Cop City a fight for freedom everywhere and in the South? Um, looking at, um this movement as a as a you know all the, all the different layers it, it is and plays but we we also are curious about specifically the role of um um the south that that uh, of the of the this country playing in the larger landscape and i know we have comrades on the call here also down there that it would be nice to hear from later but yeah, so that's that's that question. How is Stop Cop City a fight for freedom everywhere and in the South? I think it is very important for us to have a really clear grasp on agency. 
Um, and I believe that that is a bit of a leading question, to be frank with you, that already presumes an answer. Uh, because regardless of what happens with Cop City, we are in a hyper-militarized country. So I think what is very important is that we know that this is one battle in a much larger war. And when we lose sight of that, I think that we do ourselves a great disservice throughout the country right now, you have different municipalities doubling down on militarized police training facilities especially in large majority black cities because 2020 scared the bejesus out of white corporations, especially the ones in black cities. And let us be very clear, um, the mayors of these municipalities and even the police in these municipalities are under orders. And if God forbid we were to mow down all those black folk, we'd still have major problems. So let us be very clear about that. Um, so I, I think that what we have to see is that this is one battle in a much larger fight in abolition in and of itself. Even if we stop Cop City, we still have people dying in the Fulton County Jail every day. So I, I, I think that we, we can't get stuck believing that this is the whole fight right here in Cop City. And this is a part of the shift that I'm currently making right now in regards to how I engage with the movement. Um, because what we're going to need is direct action, especially among those most affected. I've been in the struggle for two and a half years and I have not interacted with that many black men and it bothers me every day. And I don't know what that's saying about the constitution of the movement. But what I do know is that unless we are willing to care for these folk early on, before they just start filling up the jails, we'll have a problem. And we cannot depend on the government to do that either. So now, you know, at the end of the day, what has kept this fight going is folks doing, you know, a little bang, bang, a little smash, smash in the night and sabotaging equipment, so forth and so on. But if that is the only uh, aspect of the fight and abolition that you are interested in, I don't know what the world looks like if you're running. And I don't like what it would look like. So that's something that I need to be very clear about, that this is one aspect of a fight for and that we must look at these things very holistically in order to have a world that we wish to see and also for people to embrace the vision of the world that we wish to see. Because at the end of the day, right, if you're talking about a radically different world where we are prioritizing community care and wellness over carceral punishment, and I look at how you're treating each other and how you're engaging in the world, and it doesn't add up, I won't believe you. And that is a problem that we must address in our meetings. I think that you just hit it right on the head that it's an aspect, right? Like we understand these diversity of tactics um, to be useful, but in our toolkit, unless we are creating ways to heal, creating ways to defend our joy so we can organize our rage, then what it really looks like is a bunch of rage. And that's not even what we're fighting for. So thank you so much for just hitting that so well. And you started to speak to it y'all um, just now, Matthew. And, and so the next question is, how is this movement a fight against not just the militarization of police, but also police as a political force. I see you, Asha too, maybe say, I see you're not in way, but. Yeah, uh, I'd love to speak on that. Uh, 
Well, it's actually a like when I first heard stuff cop city, I thought it was like, oh, okay, abolition, hey, I'm down, like, woo. But policing, like sometimes I forget, like, not everybody's an abolitionist. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> first I gotta think of like when we think of policing, we gotta ask ourselves, does it even work? Like when you're in an emergency, who do you call? I usually do not call the police because they don't they don't help me. <laughs> like, um, let's see. Oh, I remember, I remember my bike got stolen once. The police ain't doing nothing. And in more serious things, um, when police do arrive to the scene, they might try and criminalize you, especially if it's like a mental health emergency. They're gonna try and criminalize you in a way that is dehumanizing, is violence. And when I think of policing, especially in Chicago, um, with the issue of gun violence, policing does not stop gun violence. Policing, they react to gun violence, but they're not gonna stop it. In fact, I remember I remember this thing that happened, was it two years ago? There's like a mass shooting that happened outside of a funeral home. And the police, they were actually there. They were like, I think a block away. They didn't stop it. They, they did not address it because they only have the power to react, not to prevent. And for me, uh, as I'm pursuing a degree in public health, uh, uh, you got to think of upstream solutions. So with public health, it's about prevention. And when they're like, yeah, we just need better training. We just need a shiny new building. We just need to build a cop city to practice violence, to practice violence on our communities. That's not, that's not resolving violence. It's not preventing violence. It's not... Um, investing in the people is investing in just state violence. It's not a permanent, it's like, it's like a Band-Aid solution to, to something that has roots in practically everything this country was made on. And when we think of, wait, let's see what, I mean, it's like have comments. Yeah, Oakland cops, they, they don't do much. When we think of 911 um, emergency response, I wonder like, like hex or so, did the police really resolve your issue. For me, no. <laughs> and when I think of city budgets, they reflect what they invest in their city. And with the city of Chicago, with our discretionary budget, 40% um, of our tax dollars goes to the Chicago Police Department. And that's, uh, well, now it's over $1.8 billion. So imagine that being spent elsewhere. And that's where defunded police, of course, comes in. So when we think of policing as a legitimate institution, we got to ask, does it even work? Does it stop sexual violence? Or do the police engage in the same activities, especially in these migrant um, detention centers? There's been uh, po police caught um, sexually assaulting minors. So they don't stop sexual violence, they perpetrate it. So when we think of policing, we have to think of, how do we actually keep our community safe without an outside state or an outside solution? Because they don't know our communities. They don't know what are the root causes of how harm perpetuates, how harm forms. Because interpersonal harm, um, the, first pers the first time someone enters into a violent situation is like, before they even become... Uh, before they engage in violence themselves, they usually are victim of violence. So when we consider that, there's like many layers that contribute to how people might act. And this is just thinking of patriarchy. This is thinking of misogyny. This is just thinking of misogynier. And I guess a classic example is like the Megan Thee Stallion case and the Tory Lane is, whatever his name is. And I think that's just a pivotal, <laughs> like it's it's very... Like, I don't know, it's very current in my circles of like, well, not my circles, but like my age range. And I'm like, oh, we're cooked. We really have to start having conversations of misogyny here because misogyny here leads to violence. It leads to violence against Black women. And uh, well, again, <laughs> I'm just going back to like in circles here, but what is policing going to resolve? Like, we have to change the culture. We have to change how we interact with each other. We have to not instantly shut someone out during a conflict, but 
yeah, I just don't think policing works. Policing, it came from slave patrol. It came from breaking labor strikes. It came from protecting stolen private property on indigenous lands. Policing is not meant for safety. It's for control, essentially. But that's my thoughts on policing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Policing as a, as a specific strategy um, of the ruling class. Um, so, yes, that this has been an amazing discussion so far. Looking at the time, um, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, oh, sorry, I almost fell. Um, there's this one last question um, that we're going to open it up to the whole audience to weigh in on as well. Um, uh, and then I think we, in the, the time we have left after that, if there is any, um, open it up for the audience. If you have any questions out there you'd like um, to share, um, write it, feel free to write it in the chat um, and we'll take stack. Um, but basically the, the, you know, finishing off this segment of questions about what is this a fight for? And then what is this a fight against? Um, and holding those two together, how is this a um, how is this a fight against ecological devastation? Well, if I could just speak to uh, some of those issues uh, on the same road that they are planning to build Cop City, you have what three different detention facilities uh, and a landfill. Uh, you have like historical dumping in the area. Uh, you have what chemical weapons testing and all sorts of runoff from the site already. Then on top of that, since February, they had shut off the ecological monitoring systems since they tried to ram Cop City down our throat. And this one, the only one in Georgia that was shut off and then intimidated folks uh, such as like the South River Watershed Alliance, when they tried to observe them, they said that they could uh, continue uh, using the monitor because they were afraid that terrorists would get it. Like and some of their excuses are so absurd, right? That I think it just becomes important that we keep raising the profile and broadening the base of people speaking out against it. And I mean, that's that's really the path we see um but i i digress uh anyhow uh, every time that it rains more than a tenth of an inch okay a tenth of an inch in south atlanta the cab uh where they're putting this facility there is sewage that runs from the atlanta the cab uh sewage system into the water supply tenth of an inch now they're trying to uh, put down more concrete where trees used to be and soak up so much of that storm water. What do you think is going to happen? And then in addition to that, uh, the Clean Water Act that was passed in 1972, there had been no other precedent of there being no deadline or punishment for enforcement of the Clean Water Act except right here in South DeKalb, where they're building Cop City. And then in addition to that, the Supreme Court just rolled back those protections from the Clean Water Act last month. Now, you'll have lots of liberals that will get on TV when a travesty like Flint, Michigan happens or you know, Jackson, Mississippi happens. So, this is outrageous. How did this happen? because they're continually lukewarm throughout all these causes. So this fight, I mean, this fight just it encapsulates so much. And I think that that's why it's so important symbolic because in real time, it's showing all the country's BS. At the same time, and that's where I think that Cop City is important 
because it's essentially an allegory for all the lies they tell us about everything, right? So if you got an issue with how this country runs, they're telling us right here how it really works. And we've gone through, we've gone through the whole, you know, dog and pony show, so they can't say anything. They can't dismiss it like a and that's why, you know, certain like strategies, like the electoral strategies, although, you know, even I'm kind of suspicious of them a lot of the time, are important. Right? Because these are the ways that generally, you know, the old folks would try to, you know, shut folks down. Well, well, have you voted yet? No, you can't come. Back. No, we did everything. No, 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 no. We showed up. We showed up more than you all in the city council. Like, you know, we've set records that you all have never done about anything. That and, and so like it's just we just keep hitting the button, especially on issues like this. And uh the environmental thing has been the most appealing case, especially to older black folks and folks. Uh and I think that's important because it really scratches the itch where people are like, we know, like. Thank you. We've known that there's been something off, like with, you know, just like the certain diseases that kids are getting way before time, like, you know, 17 year olds having brain tumors and stuff like that. And I'm just talking about my best friend's sister. Right. Like this, I mean, this isn't, you know, like made up or like, you know, I mean, so it's just like in real time, we're blowing the case over. And so I think that that's where the ecological fight is uh, still so pressing for this project because it's only going to get worse from here. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, and you know, th that question isn't meant to you know draw a distinction necessarily between the the human community and the non-human community you know we we are all members of this ecosystem our ecosystems that we belong to right um but specifically the the way we need to understand like you were just saying the the yeah. complete assault on our non-human kin as well as you know us that's happening um is so important to understand right the 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 um extent to which that can happen uh is not infinite right there 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 are limits to that um and and that's so important to understand and um so opening this up does, does anyone else have any thoughts on this question um uh here or all all of our folks listening in we have how many people are here right now a lot um if there's no, if there's no thought, yeah. I just want to maybe open it up to Siobhan. Um, because this, yeah, I just want to maybe open it up to Siobhan before we ask questions. I'm sorry to take you everywhere this time, but I think like the y'all have just been so powerful and I've gotten to learn so much. And I believe like our shared learning um, is probably the most important. No, thank you, Mac. And I affirm uh, all the, the good words and sentiments of my relatives uh, this evening. I think where, where I want to just talk about uh, just briefly is that how can we normalize the resistance? How can we normalize the dissent that is going on? And we're not just a special character of anarchist or a special character of people who are protesters, that this is all of our children. This is all of our lives. You know, I can remember just a few months ago, I asked my children to take uh, some recycling over to the city recycling bin. And it was after 11. I worried about if they would encounter the local police force harassing them. Is that, that thought should have never crossed my mind. This is something that we all face. And we've normalized it to the point where we've demonized saying something bad against this institution, bad against this system. This, 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 this thing that we've been indoctrinated since we were children to accept and force as a uh, force to receive as reality. And that's what my hope is, is that through conversations just like this. And even I have, like I said, I have some relatives on the, the call, the phone, uh, the, the, the Zoom meeting here is that that this mass will still continue to build and say we will not tolerate what's going on in the world around us, because, like I said, you know, 
it, it's so normalized. You know, I, I do use terms I saw in the chat where it was a concept of paramilitarism was used. I do use that in reference to the United States. I do use that in reference to police forces, even though that is not even acceptable language uh, here in this country. But that's exactly what it is, especially, you know, we think of Standing Rock. Those were hired firms that were brought in to police uh, who were for profit entities that were brought in there to so-called police what was going on. I saw them. You know, I remember going into a sweat lodge to pray with my relatives there and a helicopter went right above us the whole time. We're spiritually engaging this earth. So my hope is that the only thing I want to say is that this is something that impacts all of us. And we need our aunties, our uncles, our cousins, our, our grandmas, everyone to say no, that life is what we define it to be. And that's what I hear my relatives saying is that we have that power. We have that authority. We have that in our indigenous ways. We have that sovereignty to say, this is how we're going to exist. So that's why I have no shame uh, in what I say when I go before a city council, before I go through uh, even a Atlanta Police Foundation, whoever it may be, I'll say the same thing. I say the same, and I feel like I say the same thing over and over again. Uh, I'll say it to my tribal communities here. Because I want us to be in a place where we can say, well, this isn't appropriate. And, and that's what my hope is, that, you know, it's not just something, you know, that it's not a special designation as, uh, you know, antagonist or these kind of things. We're people. We're humans. We're part of the, the a species in this ecosystem. And we shouldn't be doing harm to everyone, everything. And when we realize that, when we realize the corner that we're being pushed into, and it does tie to economic exploitation, we don't need money. We don't need these. These things were not on this continent before colonization. The way of exploiting human beings, the way of exploiting the natural world, the way of exploiting air and water, the way of exploring you know, land, all of these, even you know, the, the commodification of debt, the commodification of even dying, that's not reality. And that's what's feeding the system, every direction that we go into. And that's really what's freaking everybody out is that we don't believe in that. You want water, I'm going to give you water. You want, you want me to, to have a relationship with you, I'm going to have a relationship. We don't have to buy it. You know, we live each other with reverence you know, with all, all species. And that's what my hope is, is that now our relatives everywhere, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm based out of Oklahoma. I'm in a, a very, very uh, hostile environment here, um, you know, in more Oklahoma. I don't have no problem saying that. Um, and, but we still got to stand. And so that's what my hope is. So forgive me for talking too long. I know there's some questions and my, my relatives have to go. But I wanted to say that little bit because when I started this journey on other avenues and then also with Stop Cop City, this isn't what we want. This isn't what's going to bring peace and wellness to our peoples, all of our people. And that's what I told I tell folks. Never in any situation across the world has the increase increasing the amount of weapons on the street ever brought a peaceful society. Never. It's only brought more violence. And that's not coming from the people. That's coming from the so-called police forces, police entities. It's only going to increase the violence. Put down your weapons. And then we'll talk about what we can be. That's what I ask of everybody. So forgive me. Um, I know we have some questions. I, I can't hang on a little bit longer. So forgive me, Asha and Matthew, folks here. Uh, thank you. I have to head out to you. Yay. That was that was phenomenal. Oh wow. Thank you all everybody. It was truly a pleasure. Much oh, applause. You. Oh, it's over. Oh. I know, right? We did hit our 530 mark and I know Matthew had to go. And honestly, please do not apologize for the wisdom. I want to before Matthew goes say thank you so much for your time, your love for this movement and for all the work that you do to make the another world that we all know is possible. Um I think we will maybe ask, I mean, if Asha and, and Javad could maybe stay for a couple minutes, I think, yeah, yeah, we would like to open up for a few questions. We do want to be respectful of each other's time, so we may not get to all of them, 
if you put some questions in the chat, we can save the chat and maybe send them out to some of them. But of course, want to ask that we all understand to respect each other's time. So you might, it might be a while for you to get an answer. But um, regardless, that maybe there may be an effort to do that. Um, yeah, do we have any questions? I did see two in the chat about the petition. Um, and if folks, uh, you know, I think that we know that folks were harassed for getting, you know, the petition signed for even putting out flyers. We know that people who are passing out flyers got RICO charges. But um, there was a question about us, uh, are folks going to be able to, to vote on this? I know that the city of Atlanta has been trying to, to keep that from happening. Um, do we know about that? I know a little bit of, of what I hear. Like I said, it's transmitted through our comrades in, in different ones. I do believe we, we hit that threshold um, of signatures for the referendum. Uh, but I do know there's numerous uh, resistance tactics that are being taking place. I think even the verification of those signature processes, I know Matthew would have been one who would have known it more intimately what the, the, the name was. Um, they're trying that tactic. There's still litigation challenging that it's even a valid um, uh, uh, referendum. Um, but I think it was over 110,000 or something, the last I had heard. So it's there. But like like we're starting to realize, it's just one avenue of resistance is what I would say. Um, and I don't know if we have any of our, our comrades on the call still. But there, oh, Lorraine's here. Uh, Lorraine might be able to uh, to answer that a little bit better than, than me. I don't know if she's allowed to, to say something, Lorraine. Absolutely, yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Well, just uh, just to say also, uh, yeah, there's as approximately 112,000 um, petitions that were gathered. Um, we've been doing internal processing on them to verify, and a lot of them are very difficult to verify. Some of them are people we let people sign, unfortunately, who were outside the city of Atlanta. So there's going to be some eliminators. We wanted to work until we had twice as many as we needed that we figured that would be safe, that we'd at least have half of those signatures being validated. They were hand, they're handing them in tomorrow. We're having a big thing in the morning, press conference, all kinds of stuff at City Hall to hand those petitions in. Um, the City Council was mainly responsible for getting the process together for how to verify them and get the city to okay them. And it's taken a long time to even figure out what they're doing. They don't know half of what they're doing themselves, I think. So there's going to be a real process of watching and making sure we have other people who can be there when they say these are not valid to to also look at them and say, oh, yes, they are. You know, um, the other thing is that it's not going to be on the ballot in November. It, there's a lot of history behind the timing and it all and how fast we got to do it and taking advantage of the court that expanded the time frame because the court, original court, district court, federal court said, yes, you can allow other people in Georgia outside the city of Atlanta to collect petitions because they weren't even doing that. They were, it was telling us we had to have a city of Atlanta resident always witnessing every signature. Um, and that was, the district court would say you don't have to do that. They gave us more time. Problem is, it's now been appealed to the circuit court, the, the appeals court in the federal system. So that threw us all in a like, are we going to going to accept any of the ones we've done between the original uh, end time and now? Will they be because they've been done by a lot by people outside the city of Atlanta? So that's what made the process change. And we had to get them in as soon as possible. But really, with that number that we have, we sure hope that they're not going to try some other shenanigans. By the way, they're stepping back on, they were going to use this Democratic Black-led um, administration in Atlanta was going to use signature match program that had been used by Republicans to, to repress the vote in the past. They were going to use that, and it, it was very easy to throw out lots of signatures that way. Um, and they were going to use that. And, and I think they made, we made them be ashamed of even suggesting that they were going to use that. Um, so hopefully 
the process, we don't know. It's it's like like Yvonne said, it's really up in the air whether how much they're going to press, you know, their tactics on and on and on. But they've been exposed a lot, and I think they're looking like real um, repressive, you know, backwards people. So hopefully that will the shame there will help them moderate how they're dealing with it. Now, we're not going to be on November. Probably it'll be the next election here, which is likely to be a primary election in the March of next year. But but when it's on the ballot, we are convinced that if it gets on the ballot, it'll be voted down. Now, what they'll do at that point, there's going to be a whole lot of legal stuff happening. Clearly, they're not going to just sit down and say, okay, well, I guess we're not going to do it anymore. No, but at least we'll know that the majority of people who bothered to vote in the city of Atlanta are opposed to it. So anyway, we're hoping. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, we don't know each other, but I was actually at the Home Depot action at, during the last um, <laughs> week of action and was outside the jail shouting about it. Um, so thank you so much for, for being here, for that wisdom you're able to talk about. Um, and thank you for, I mean, I could, tell from the entire community that you were a movement elder that was loved, respected, and held to such high regard. So the fact that we just even got to spotlight you for a moment, um, I just think Thank I'm you. like, as soon as you came up, I was like, that's, oh, cool. So Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions? I think maybe we got a couple more and then we'll let her, and then we'll, we'll take, we'll, we'll say goodbyes. I did hear some, I did read in the chat, somebody asked about next steps. Um, and the truth is, is that that's a big comp, that's a big question, considering we're having a national dialogue about every city being a stop cop city. Um, and so I think like us continuing to convene um, in ways to like continue to support each other, um, oh, cause fuck borders, fuck walls. Um, and but yeah, are there like, is there any way right now that folks uh, uh, could think of that that could support any of the movement work that are happening in your area? Are there ways to plug into the the cop city movement or the um, or anything that's going on in Chicago, like a next step? And I'm seeing if, if folks want to put in their social media handles in the chat so people can follow you because y'all are big news bears out here. Um, that would be cool. I think, and for, for us, Mac, um, that it's been really uh, an evolution process because we engage this movement from a spiritual perspective. Like we're practitioners. We weren't, you know, an organization or anything, but it's just recognizing the harms that I have already talked about, you know, throughout our time together tonight. So we're trying to put things in place to help us have a mechanism where we can receive funds um, that can give some transparency to help us. Because I believe that any step in our homelands is the resistance. Anytime we come back to our sacred sites, our village sites is the resistance. So the, the I call them Muscogee migrations. Anytime we come back home is that resistance, you know, as we come back to that, that mentality of how we're to exist. So we're just now putting that up. I'm hoping within the next few months, even Matthew has been a catalyst uh, for helping us. Um, you know, to receive those types of funds. But right now, we, I have not accepted anything other than just from assistance from, uh, you know, uh, other communities. And even, I have to be honest, it's kind of scary right now with how if your name is just listed on something that they're trying to put you in these, uh, you know, add you to these RICO charges or domestic terrorism charges. So we're just really trying to be m meticulous in our language and, and the things we do. But I'm like, heaven forbid, I mean, we're sitting here protecting the very air that you breathe, I mean, the very water that you drink. And, you know, and I'm still going to do that. So so we're just trying to do those things. But I will put my my Instagram is I do put uh, most of the work that we do. We do have a full um, schedule this fall of trying to interact. I know there are some more civic entities. I do believe in speaking to whoever will listen. Um, you know, we, we are doing some things that talk about concepts of land back, concepts of rematriation and what we can do. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that calendar's out there up until, you know, the end of the year. Um, so that's what my, my hope is. And, um, but 
I think holding you know these these conversations is the most crucial. We are doing this amongst our own uh, Muscogee Indigenous peoples. Um, we have one uh, town hall session scheduled this fall um, because we want our own people to start wrestling with this. And in fact, I've had numerous just keep coming. I need more. How can I get involved? And really, it just starts with normalizing it. You know, having the T-shirts, the defend our homelands, having those T-shirts, having an understanding just to, to accept it. But I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Asha or whoever is next. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, incredible resources. I'm like, oh, wait, I got I to gotta get this one down, get that one down. But uh, definitely the instant that came to mind was, again, we are dissenters because of the action today and, and um I noticed a lot of y'all are elders so if y'all got grandchildren uh we are dissenters they have a fabulous organizing fellowship um to basically get U.S. militarism off of our college campuses because you know they recruit us they recruit especially STEM students for their war profiteering for their war science and as we connect policing to militarism I think that's a good connection to stop um, that way. But uh, also uh, thinking of local campaigns, just like when I think of local campaigns that chip away at the foundations of policing and prisons for abolition, I definitely think checking out the Treatment Not Trauma campaign is pretty cool if you're in Chicago or Bring Chicago Home, a fabulous campaign to uh well, tax the rich for houselessness and get resources for houselessness. But um, also just reading more on abolition. Um, if you guys are interested, I shared a few of those in the earlier chat. But uh, definitely follow Stop Cop City on Instagram and defend the Atlanta Forest on Instagram because um, those two sites, they're like, they're always on it. Like, if you want to know what's going on, check them out. But yeah, thank you guys so much. And then I think this will be our last question. Um, Libby, I see your hand. And uh, please forgive me if I said that wrong. No, it's all good. You pronounced it correctly. Um, my question as a college student, I think a lot of conversations we've been having and hearing about like the intersectionality and how we want to continue the movement into other spaces. Um, how do we continue to like reinvigorate the youth base into continuing these movements along and making sure that they we lay a good base and a good foundation to continue that for the future. Uh, uh, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Aisha. go ahead. Oh, sure, thanks. Uh, I don't know if I'm still considered young. I, I don't know. I'm 22, but when I think of young, I definitely think of youth like teenagers and when I was a teenager I was part of this amazing organization called Asada's Daughters and I think having a nice political home is always a great start just to be surrounded by people who want to do movement work and want to make the world a better place and you got excited you got you got to make it exciting but also what I found helpful for like us retaining people is um for me they offered bus passes that came in clutch when you know we we still have to pay as students uh for busing if you're a cps student and offering food was definitely a kicker like oh we get dinner too we get fed but taking care of the people meeting them where they're at is always crucial meeting their needs like you can't organize if you're hungry. You can't organize if you're cold or don't have a way home. So uh, also just checking in with you, like don't get right into it. Ask how they do it, you know? But youth, um, it is interesting because youth organizing, it's when I, when I was a youth, it was just super, it was more so like a solid community to have fun with, but also mess up stuff. That, that was the fun part to actions, but yeah, yeah. No, and, and I think I don't think I'm the right one to answer either. I'm much older than you, Asha, um, by a couple of decades. <laughs> so, but I do know the movement everywhere I go is young people, you know, even here in, in Oklahoma. So I think where I try to center myself is just letting the truth out 
saying, here's what we're going through and let the young people have that freedom to uh, respond accordingly, how they see fit. And so that's basically what my, uh, oh, forgive me for using this language, but my attack mode is just making sure that information is where it needs to be. And in fact, I really am encouraged by the student movement in Atlanta right now. Um, they provided a lot of the energy to uh, to do the work with the referendum. Um, but I just get so far behind, like even here, I have my own children and everyone who are wanting to, to do more. Um, I just haven't been able to organize us the way I would hope. So I, I'm excited because that that fervor and that hunger is there. And to be honest, that my interactions also have been primarily with our children and some of our school systems so that they can have the truth uh, in their hands as they get older so that we don't have to deconstruct, you know, you know, let's just say uh, the concept of qualified immunity. So we don't have to deconstruct all these things that we're just made to, forced to accept. And they'll be like, oh, and that's the part of what we've been doing is just our, whenever we go back, we go to the schools, we dance, we teach, we have our children talking creek to trees and things like that. So um, but that's some of the things that I hope to and uh, to just do. But I appreciate everything. I think I am going to have to step out at this moment. Um, I have uh, my, my family's uh, getting a little hungry. I got to feed them. So, uh, but I appreciate the, the time and appreciate uh, getting to meet you, Asha, and, and everyone. Like whenever we interact, you know, come come see me or whatever it might be. You're all my relatives, and I'll do my my best to live a life that honors your walk as well. So, Madoja Gajische. Thank you so much, Shabon, for your time, for all of your wisdom. Yes, your heart was felt today. And then with that, I think that we too will kind of wrap it up. I means Asha, I want to give you just as much of a shout out and telling you that you're dope. Um, really appreciate everybody who came today. Really appreciate the um, question of engagement. And all of the, what I saw in the chat was like, not just like the like-mindedness, um, but was the, was the fire to be like, how do we get involved? Or I have ways to help. Um, so as long as we keep doing that work and keep finding each other, um, then I think, I mean, I don't know, I'm a pretty hopeful person, sometimes optimist to a, to a, to a fault, but that's because I do have that hope that it, as a discipline, um, and are always trying to create ways, um, to, like I said, defend joy so we can organize our marriage. I know Patrick is going to give a quick shout out about the League of Revolutionaries, um, and then we will wrap up. So thank you all again for your time. Ashka, you were amazing. Thank you for everything you do. Yes, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Uh, this was such a invigorating conversation. And I'm like, oh, we got it. We want to get into action. I'm like, oh, what's something I can help plan? But this is an incredible conversation. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to join y'all. No, thank you. And um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I know, I have hope. Um, I firmly believe this is won't, won't be the last time that you know we'll try to create space for um, this types of th these types of um, ideas and truth telling. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone mm -hmm. for your comments for sharing. Um, this has just been incredible. Um, the uh, um, this event was put on um, uh, by the League of Revolutionaries. Um, and uh, speaking of, of intergenerational organizing and movements, um, you know, I joined the league when I was about 15 or so um, and was, you know, um, immediately given, a, a, you know, through, through the political education, um, you know, given so much, um, you know, uh, th a thought and care and um, I hope to do that you know for the youth uh, myself because um, the the development of consciousness of young people is what's gonna save us you know um, if anything um, the so a little bit more about the league if, in case you're not familiar um, uh, we are um, we we're an organization we join other revolutionaries um, uh, who challenged the ruling class on the immorality of uh, its ruthless destruction of the earth. 
and life all over. Uh, we are multiracial, uh, multigenerational, multigender, working class organization dedicated to revolutionary education and struggle. Um, and I'll, I'll add to that the the cross regional, um, as can, you can tell by everyone, the different time of day, you've seen everyone's um, image here. Um, uh, we, we trace injustice to the capitalist system, private property is a system, and we seek to show how society's problems can be solved when it is recognized uh, along corporate lines. Uh, society must be or reorganized so that the abundance made possible by uh, science, technology, um, ancient wisdom, and ancestral wisdom uh, benefits everyone. Uh, and a society, that society that puts uh, humanity and nature above profits. Um, and a little bit about, you know, the, the direction where we come, where we come from, where we're going, is we just simply see ourselves as, um, uh, you know, dedicated to being the voice uh, or trying to be a voice and a um, system of support for, you um, the frontline revolutionaries who are creating a new world right now um because we know that the the introduction uh for example of uh, digital technology um and automation is fundamentally changing the society that we live in right um when the the corporate um ruling class is able to produce things without humans they will definitely do that, right? They have every interest to do that, which means in a system that uh, awards you your basic necessities based on how much money you have, your ability to pay, that means um, enormous amounts of us out of access to our basic needs, right? And and it's as simple as that. And though that's not simple, really, it um, what what it what it comes down to is uh, an enormous opportunity to um uh create a new system right where it doesn't matter how much money you have doesn't matter um the color of your skin doesn't matter where you come from you are a human being right or you know we we live in a uh on a planet that um you know has has existed for uh billions of years without private property without money right and so all we're saying is that that is going to be the thing that um replaces the system ultimately so that's what we're dedicated towards and what we are aimed to try to unite people around and tell people about if they have any questions so um yeah uh, if uh you are interested in, in staying involved with us follow us on social media hit us up um we're we're easy to get a hold of and we we really want to um, talk to you and and build with you. I just dropped a link in the chat, and I'll just quickly before we say goodbye add that like studying with the league and understanding social change and being able to like study revolution um, gave me the biggest deep breath of my life. Then I was like, how am I supposed to survive under capitalism? And then I found out that oh, it's dying. Capitalism actually is over. It's why we're in late stage. We're not fighting for that anymore. We're fighting for what's next. And so I look forward to being able to fight for what's next with all of you, with these revolutionaries across the country. Um, and with that, have a beautiful day.